The heartland of central and southern Canada holds a wealth of landscapes. Vast forests, rolling grasslands, lakes beyond counting. And a remarkable cast of animal characters. To the European explorers who arrived here in the 17th century, the boreal forest and prairies appear to be pristine wilderness, shaped by nature alone. But the story of Canada's heartland is full of surprises. It's late March on the grasslands of southern Saskatchewan, and one of the prairie's most amazing displays is kicking off. Male sharp-tailed grouse are strutting their stuff, sorting out their pecking order before the females arrive. This is a dancing competition. The top-ranked dancer will claim a central position and be best placed to catch the female's eye when they arrive. use the same dancing grounds year after year, a fact well known by another resident of this open landscape. People have lived alongside the wildlife of the prairie for thousands of years. Blackfoot First Nation people still perform a traditional dance inspired by the springtime antics of the prairie shedding, a bird they often hunted for food. Long before Europeans arrived in Canada, its people developed cultures based on an intimate knowledge of the land and its wildlife. They also developed practices that changed the landscape in which they lived. In 1691, English explorer Henry Kelsey was one of the first Europeans to travel through southern Canada and get a glimpse of this amazing prairie landscape. His Assiniboine companions may have told Kelsey about the rich hunting grounds of the great grass plains. But nothing could have prepared him for the spectacle he was about to witness. and herds numbering up to four million animals. Bison are huge, powerful creatures with an aggressive nature. At the time of Kelsey's arrival, the grasslands stretched from central Mexico through the United States into southern Canada, from Lake Winnipeg in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west. These grasslands supported many different species. 
but there was one that appeared purpose-built for this open country, the pronghorn antelope. With a top speed of almost 100 kilometers per hour, pronghorns are the fastest hoofed animals on Earth. During Kelsey's time, there were at least 20 million pronghorn on the plains. Early European travelers saw the open prairie as a wild, untouched landscape. They were wrong. The Prairie First Nations were great hunters. And they'd been changing this landscape for thousands of years with a very powerful tool. Fire. Fire kills young trees while leaving grass roots unscathed. So these intentional fires kept the prairie open by preventing trees from spreading across it. And these people preferred grass to trees because the animals they hunted were grazers. The fires cleared away the dead and dried out grass. The ash fertilized the soil. So by the following year, a rich new crop of grass would grow to attract the grazing animals. The bison herds themselves also help support the grass. Their dung return nutrients to the soil and their hooves disturb the ground allowing a diversity of plants to grow. The interaction of grass, bison and people sustained a rich, stable environment long before Europeans arrived on the prairie. And there was one other major element influencing the prairie landscape. Wolves. Wolves played a crucial role in maintaining the balance between bison and prairie, keeping the herds on the move, preventing the grassland from becoming overgrazed. Plains people lived alongside wolves and understood how they hunted. They knew that bison with new calves, instead of running, would often stand their ground. As long as the adult bison hold their nerve, wolves won't risk injury by approaching within range of those horns and hooves. Everything in wolves' clothing is what it seems.
dressed in wolf skins and mimicking their movements. The human hunters could approach within a few meters of their quarry. Their trick then was to stampede the herd in one specific direction. In full flight, it's hard for the herd to suddenly slow down. By chasing bison over steep cliffs, known as buffalo jumps, hunters could secure enough meat to feed the entire community. Smaller inhabitants, like these black-tailed prairie dogs, make their home underneath the prairie grassland. Prairie dogs live in vast colonies or towns with kilometers of burrows. The entrance is surrounded by volcano-shaped mounds of earth. These act as lookout points from which the adults warn each other of approaching danger. This year's pups are now big enough to venture out though they never stray far from the safety of their burrows. Toward midsummer, a new batch of babies is ready for its first public appearance. These burrowing owl chicks were hatched underground. In a treeless landscape, a vacant prairie dog burrow is the perfect nesting option. The owls are not so much burrowing as borrowing. Whenever mum or dad appears, the chicks converge on them like a pack of wolves. The chicks are growing fast and their appetites seem insatiable. In the pancake flat landscape, a prairie dog's earth mound gives the owls a panoramic view. In a treeless world, any height helps to spot trouble. The coyote knows he's been spotted and continues on his way. The chick takes advantage of the afternoon breeze to try out its wings. A couple of months from now, these chicks will be fully fledged and the family will migrate south. While most of us think of prairie as grassland, there's another element to this landscape that is every bit as important to wildlife. Canada's heartland is studded with countless lakes. 
scoured out thousands of years ago by Ice Age glaciers. Some estimates put the figure at over 10 million. That's far more lakes than people here. A crucial resource for water birds, returning from nesting grounds in the Arctic on their long migration south. Quill Lakes in Saskatchewan draws in tens of thousands of snow geese, looking for a place to rest and feed. The reserve attracts rarer seasonal migrants too, often in huge numbers. Sandhill cranes renew old acquaintances and greet each other with their peculiar leaping dance. Once they have rested and fed, the migrants must move on. Within a few weeks, these lakes will begin to freeze up. And the enormous flocks of ducks and geese will be far to the south. Winter comes early to Canada's heartland. By late October, the first frosts have arrived. Winter signals a change in the fortunes for much of the wildlife of the heartland. Buffalo had the advantage during the summer months, but wolves have the edge now. Here, in northern Alberta, the deep snow causes the bison to travel in single file to save energy. Those behind benefit from the snow plowing efforts of the front runners. But for the last in line, there may be a deadly price. Once separated from the rest of the herd, this youngster's outlook is bleak. Mm. 
While a bison's front end is well protected, its rump is not. So any further attempt to run away would simply play into the wolf's jaws. And with the herd gone, the young bison has no alternative but to try and stand its ground. The bloodied wolf can afford to take time out to quench her thirst with a mouthful of snow. The odds are clearly in her favor. Finally, the game of survival comes down to a choice of ends. The bison needs to keep the wolf facing its armored head, while the wolf wants to get at its quarry's defenseless rear. Primordial scenes like this would once have been common in Canada's heartland. But today, most of the wild bison herds are long gone. And this is one of the last places in the world where wolves and bison can still determine each other's fate. North of the prairies, a belt of conifer trees, the boreal forest, stretches the entire width of Canada. It is considered to be the largest intact forest left in the world. Falling snow brings magic to the woodlands. The first snow brings beauty to the forest, but it also brings tough times for many of the forest creatures. In central Alberta, a moose and her calves venture out into the snow searching for food. When times are tough, these willow twigs could make the difference between life and death for these moose. By midwinter, the temperature has dipped below minus 40 degrees. On a frozen lake, a deer has succumbed to the cold. The tattered carcass looks as if it was savaged by a large predator during the night. Now, in the morning light, the hungry whiskey jacks give way to the larger, more powerful ravens. The squabbling ravens sort out their pecking order over this winter feast. Opening a frozen carcass would be impossible for the ravens. So who did it? A wolverine. With its muscular body, frost-shedding fur coat, and big snowshoe paws, a wolverine can cover large tracts of frozen wilderness in search of food. Just over a meter long, the wolverine looks like a small bear, but is actually a member of the weasel tribe.
rarely seen, this is some of the first footage of wild wolverines ever recorded in North America. We still know very little about wild wolverines. They have rarely been studied in the wild. A hunter in its own right, it is also an expert scavenger. Its immensely powerful jaws can butcher even the most hard-frozen carcass. With its belly stuffed full, the wolverine will be able to survive several days until its next meal. Carcasses like this are a rare bonanza for scavengers in these forests. When the weather takes a turn for the worse, the hungry ravens make a last ditch attempt to fill their bellies. But in a matter of hours, the dead deer is entirely buried. Later, a young male wolverine arrives on the scene, not knowing there's a carcass hidden beneath the snow. But his senses are extraordinary. Somehow, he's able to sniff out the faint odor of frozen flesh. Even through a meter of fresh snow. In the race to survive, the wolverine wins by a nose. For the Aboriginal people of these forests, finding food in the winter required all their ingenuity. And one of their techniques looks a bit strange from the outside. Under the dark shelter of a tent, ice fishing was practiced this way by First Nations people for at least a thousand years. Beneath a hole chipped through the ice, the fisherman plays his lure hoping to attract a hungry fish within spearing range. The dark tent above keeps his silhouette from spooking the fish. Still today, ice fishing is popular among Canadians. In Quebec, hundreds of cabins have been moved onto the meter-thick ice of the St. Anne River, creating a temporary village where the whole community gathers each January for an ice fishing festival. The prize draw is the Atlantic tomcod, which migrate from the sea during the winter to spawn in fresh water. They were once harvested commercially, but today, Tomcod fishing is more about family fun. The party lasts from late December through into early February. As evening temperatures drop below minus 20 Celsius, families retreat into the warmth of their stove-heated cabins. Meanwhile, out on a frozen pond in northern Quebec, steam rises from the chimney of a different snow-covered dwelling. 
Beneath its blanket of insulating snow is a beaver's lodge. The steam plume comes from the cozy interior of the lodge, currently occupied by muskrats. Muskrats resemble beavers, but are smaller with slender tails. The muskrats are squatters here, enjoying the warmth while the owners are busy foraging outside. Beavers eat mostly leaves, twigs and bark. If times are tough though, they can draw on the fat reserves stored in their tails. Muskrats have a similar diet. The beavers keep a submerged larder of willow and aspen in their pond, so they don't have to venture out above the ice to forage in the cold winter months. Until this unique new footage was filmed inside a wild beaver's lodge, muskrats had always been thought of as freeloaders. But this muskrat can clearly be seen plastering mud onto the lodge wall, making a direct contribution to its weatherproofing. This is the first time muskrats have been recorded helping beavers to maintain a lodge. Maybe it's time to give the busy muskrat some recognition. Protected from predators inside their snow-covered stronghold, the beavers and muskrats remain insulated from the world outside until spring melts the ice on their pond. Canada has the largest wetland area in the world. And throughout the boreal forest, as winter ends, it springs to life. A pair of western greaves. This spectacular water-walking dance is their courtship display. Spring is a busy season for many creatures of these wetlands and the beavers are no exception. Their lodge is now an island, surrounded by a shallow pond that the beavers created by damming up a small creek. They must regularly patrol their dam, making sure it stays watertight. If they find a leak, they quickly set to work to fix it. Beavers are one of the largest rodents in the world and use their strength to great advantage.
All this fetching and carrying uses up a lot of energy. A beaver's diet is relatively low in calories, so they need to spend a lot of time feeding. The dam mending is completed by jamming mud and weed in the chinks between the logs. Beaver dams may span hundreds of meters. That's a lot of maintenance work for the adult pair. The beaver's pond provides a habitat for waterfowl, a pair of ring-necked ducks. Pumped up with spring hormones, Male red-winged blackbirds stake out their territory in song. A Canada goose has made her nest on top of the beaver's lodge. Now that her eggs have hatched, she needs to move her young to where they can find food. But something along the water's edge has caught her eye. Reacting to the goose's alarm call, the beaver's tail slap warns every other resident of the pond. At the pond's edge, a red-necked grebe hops off her nest. She can always lay another clutch if needs be. Though their cover has been blown, the wolves seem reluctant to give up entirely on their duck hunting ambitions. When large prey are scarce, wolves will often hunt smaller animals. But in this deep water, it's a losing game. And the wolf soon gives up the chase. Once the wolves have gone, life returns to normal. The grebe settles back down to incubate her clutch of eggs. While her mate brings an offering of water weeds. Now, the goose can take her goslings to find food. Thanks in part to the beavers, Canada's heartland is a great place for water birds and a host of other pond life. And it's not just wildlife that benefits. Beaver dammed waterways regulate the flow of rainwater, reducing flood pulses and allowing silt to settle out and clear water to flow. The effect of beavers on the landscape is so beneficial that the Blackfoot people had a saying. Beavers built the world in which we live. The early European explorers, however, saw beavers in a very different light. In the summer of 1659, two French adventurers, Radisson and Grosseillet, set off on a clandestine expedition. Their plan was to paddle their canoe deep into Canada's wild heartland, make friends amongst Aboriginal communities along their route, and encourage them to trap beavers and bring their fur pelts to Montreal to trade.
For a whole year, the Frenchmen were out of contact with the outside world. The following summer, the explorers suddenly reappeared. This time, with company. Their canoes were laden with bales of beaver pelts. All in all, there were 55 tons of furs, requiring a flotilla of 100 canoes to carry them. This was the beginning of the fur trading industry in Canada. This industry decimated the beaver population. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, there were as many as 400 million beavers on the continent. Today, there are just 12 million. Beavers vanished from many former strongholds, profoundly changing the character of the landscape. Without beaver ponds, the forest becomes drier and less diverse. And in the vast evergreen forests of Western Ontario, summer lightning is more likely to spark a huge blaze. Flames shooting over a hundred meters high. The fire front is threatening a valuable timber reserve, and there are human settlements in the area too. Action is required. Over 50 fire ranger crews and seven helicopters operated by the Ontario Fire Service are dispatched to the scene. The helicopters pick up water from a local lake to douse pockets of blazing forest. It's becoming clear that this is no ordinary fire. It is time to bring in the big guns. Canadair CL-415 water bombers carry a payload of up to six tons of water laced with fire suppressant foam. A clever design allows them to fill their water tanks on the move.
is to drench a strip of forest ahead of the advancing fire front. And with these tactics, the blaze is finally brought under control. Fire has always been a natural part of this landscape. Today, fire is recognized as an essential part of the forest cycle, and wildfires are allowed to burn unchecked unless they threaten life or property. While the aftermath looks like devastation, these trees have had thousands of years to adapt. In the wake of the flames, the cones of the jack pine unfurl, releasing their seeds. Over time, new trees grow up and the forest gradually recovers. But some changes to the heartland are not so readily reversed. Over three centuries of European settlement, the prairie landscape has radically changed. Neatly ploughed farms and fenced-in cattle ranches now occupy most of the original wild grassland. All that remains of the vast bison herds that once roamed the prairie is a few small managed herds in wildlife preserves and game ranches. On a game ranch in Manitoba, a female bison has just given birth. This calf is entering a world where she will be protected from predators, given extra feed in winter, and generally cosseted by her human owners. The formidable animal that once helped shape the prairie landscape has become a profitable commodity. Formed over thousands of years in an open prairie landscape, faced with the ever-present threat of marauding wolves, the calf's instinct is to struggle to its feet within minutes of birth. Domestication may have changed its circumstances, but this little bison remains wild at heart. In southwestern Alberta, near the Rocky Mountains, the prairie landscape is now dominated by farms and fences. But it doesn't mean all the wildlife has disappeared. In recent years, some surprising animals have started to reappear amongst the cattle fields and pastures in what was once their traditional prairie habitat. A grizzly bear. And she isn't alone. She has three half-grown cubs with her. These days, grizzlies are a rare sight on the prairie, but it was not always so. When Europeans came here 300 years ago, they were common across the prairies of southern Canada. But the people that settled here thought them dangerous and shot them on sight. By the middle of the last century, Grizzlies had been driven to extinction right across the prairies. However, some bear survived on the mountains to the west, occasionally wandering down to the plains. Although much of their diet is plant-based, at certain times of the year, some grizzly bears do kill and eat young livestock. 
So it's a testament to our changing attitudes that many of the people that live in this region today are willing to explore a new relationship with these amazing animals. For thousands of years, people have lived alongside wildlife in Canada's heartland. And so long as we afford nature the space it needs, it will continue to flourish and to surprise us. Thank you.